Good evening. Welcome to the September 12, 2011 Planning Commission meeting. Um, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Will the Secretary please call roll? Commissioner Ferris, absent. Commissioner Price? Here. Commissioner Reynolds? Here. Commissioner Turpel? Here. Chair Fisher? Here. Uh, public comments. Uh, members of the public are invited to address the commission on issues that are within the commission's purview and not on the agenda. Uh, I don't have any public speaker cards uh, for public comments, so we will go to number five, written comments, announcements, continuances. Mr. Town. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, but I have nothing at this time. Thank you. Will the clerk call case 6A? Hearing advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 6A regarding case LTP 20117026 Applicant Conejo Crest request to allow the removal of a landmark tree in association with the construction of eight single family dwellings. Location Northeast corner of Conejo School Road and Hillcrest Drive. Ms. Young? Yes, good evening, Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, tonight we have a request to remove um, one Southern California black walnut tree it's a native tree um, in red you could see the outline of track 5440 um, it was approved by the planning commission in 2004 along with hpd 2003-82 um, which approved the architecture and uh, site plans and also LTP 55, which allowed the encroachment into the protected zone of um, this walnut tree. Um, you can see the arrow showing where the walnut tree is, um, and it is located on lot eight. The former owner began grading the site in 2007, but did not complete the grading um, due to foreclosure of the property in 2008. Um, the property was then left vacant for several years, and the current applicant had purchased the property and resumed grading um, this summer. Native walnut trees are protected, and they're one of the four protected trees in the landmark um, tree ordinance. When the Planning Commission approved the encroachment, um, the tree was estimated to be about 13 feet from the structure of the house. And the current site condition places the tree um, eight and a half feet from the house and 10 feet above the building pad. Um, this is the site plan that was uh, approved for the house, or the grading plan that was approved. And you could see the 13 feet from the wall. And the front of the house acts as a stem wall to support the uh, slope in the tree. This shows the tree um, looking east uh, towards the open space from lot eight. And you could see the, the grade and, and the cut that was made. This is looking at the tree uh, toward the north. And on the right hand side is the, um, the trail going up to the open space. And then the house would be on the left. And this is looking northwest. Um, at lot eight and 
you could see the large two-story house uh, in the rear. Any proposal to remove an oak or landmark tree is carefully evaluated. Um, staff is recommending removal of this tree because of um, some unique circumstances relating to um, where the tree is located and uh, the grade elevation between the um, tree and the house lot. To keep the tree at its current location, um, the applicant would have to construct a nine foot high retaining wall and this will create um, several impacts. Um, access around the house will be blocked. Um, the property owner will have a very difficult time um, accessing and maintaining that upper slope. Um, this house will in effect not have any front yard at all and um, the design would be unattractive by having this tree perched up like at the height of the roof eave. Um, the tree is actually closer to the house than was originally surveyed and could be a potential fire hazard. Uh, the drip line and branches of the tree will canopy over the roof and um, will be subject to fire department clearance standards um, so that they would have to prune the tree branches uh, to be at least 10 feet away from the house. Also, the tree could be a fire conductor between the open space um, and the house. As for mitigation, um, the applicant will be required to plant six 15-gallon walnut trees to compensate uh, for removal of the landmark tree if the Planning Commission uh, approves this. Uh, the project is categorically exempt from CEQA and staff is recommending approval of the landmark tree permit based on the findings and conditions contained in the staff report. Questions of staff? I have uh, one question. Uh, was there any discussion about uh, transplanting that tree? Uh, it appears on at least the picture that was provided that two sides are already cut out. So um, it appears half the work is already done. Um, no, we've always talked. Originally, when this came to the Planning Commission, um, staff had recommended approval to remove the tree. Um, and we never talked about transplanting it. Um, can we talk about it tonight? Um, yes, we have our landscape uh, tree consultant here tonight. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, we'll go to the uh, applicant. Uh, Mr. James Dean, Mr. Dean, uh, you have 15 minutes. Please state your name and city of residence for the record. James Dean, landscape architect and tree consultant. Uh, I live in Newbury Park. My office is in Thousand Oaks for 44 years. And uh, I was looking at all the pictures up on the wall of all the previous council people, and I knew every one of them. <laughs> um, the, um, what, it, there's a whole lot of data here, and I don't know if you want me to go through you know, the reasons for it. I have a couple of things I would like to, to point out. Um, is there a... And they'll set up on that somehow. Are those, do they fold out? Um, I've been involved. Uh, I was not the original landscape architect on this project, and I did not do the tree work. Um, <clears throat> but there's some conditions out there that, that worry me some. Um, I would like to send these around to you. Um, these two pictures were taken by me, personally, uh, almost one year to date uh, apart by accident. It wasn't planned. And from almost the same position, one of them is um, um, closer in. And uh, if you look, I'm going to pass them around, but 380, 384, which is shown Lilia, can you hand him the mic? I'm sorry. 
those are the those are the uh, pictures of the tree. I'd like to pass these up for you to look at. The tree um, is this a candidate for transplant? No, it really isn't. Uh, but there's two. Um, okay, fine. Thank you. You'll note if I can approach you. There's um, two pictures there again taken almost almost to the day one year apart, two thousand ten and one was in October and the other one anyway, they're about a year apart. And you'll notice uh, up in the left hand side the tree on the one where it's labeled 384 is the older of the pictures and what's happening is the tree is uh, is suffering a chronic water deficit will that kill the tree ultimately could kill a tree uh, if the tree stayed and water were applied to it it would probably survive over time uh, <clears throat> I say that the it's not a good candidate for transplanting uh, if I were to say donate this tree to some people who do transplant trees um, they probably would not invest the money to do it because they would be taking the tree and having it keeping it for a year or so until it recovered there's not much data available on whether this tree can be transplanted they ha I don't know of any any tree planter or tree um, people who have ever done that with this specific tree. It's a shallow wooded, rooted tree. Uh, we find that in this case that the roots, rooting depth is uh, two feet above, below the surface. Um, it, <clears throat> unfortunately, what we've done is we've got, we've got a, a three-dimensional problem that was decided on a two-dimensional plan. And I'm not sure the conditions that um, we're gonna run into to save the tree uh, are justified. Uh, if you're looking at the looking at the vertical vertical on that plan here, that's actually the exact line of the uh, building line of the house. So there would there would be a uh, retaining wall at that location. In order to, uh, it's going to be the actually a building wall of the house. So it would be the building wall of the downstairs um, family room and <clears throat> in order to waterproof that I'm told by the grading contractor he's gonna have to cut that back two and a half feet I originally thought that the um, surveyor had made a mistake and it turned out it was our mistake in looking back at the survey uh, there is no there's no uh, trunk shown and we did what normally people would do and assume it to be in the middle and we had no way to verify that that at that time now there's line stakes in, survey line stakes, and we can actually stand on the line, and we can measure it to the trunk, and it's eight and a half feet, not 13. The assumptions were that we're, it was 13 feet. Um, it's been badly brutalized, and uh, it's in a level of decline that I think doesn't justify all the work that we have to do to try to save the tree. Um, there's some significant root damage here and here. This tree is normally, normally, uh, a tree that thrives on water and uh, this this soil is a very interesting phenomenon here if you look at the cut slopes that they have out there now you'll see a little thin dark colored uh, top at the top and then you see this white slope going down which is the plant material which is I'm sorry the uh, parent material the a and B horizon is about 16 inches thick and then it becomes uh, more dense and less uh, ability to, for the water to drain through. Uh, the, what is really phenomenal, and I can explain why, if you look at this picture, there's a reverse condition. You find the dark layer below the parent material. So the lighter colors on top, and you see that in several pictures that I have. And I finally figured that out because if you look, if you're at the site and you're, you mosey about 20 feet down slope towards the street, you find suddenly vertical layers of soil, vertical. So that's geologic, it's a ge geological condition. And the soil that 
the tree is growing in is actually a, a loam. It's actually a very, very good soil. And that's probably why that's the only tree of its species locally there. Um, I don't think that there's a logical thing, logical way to save this tree. Um, it requires, excuse me. Um, there's the height at this corner of the house is nine foot. The wall will be nine foot high plus six inches for freeboard uh, retaining wall. It becomes the wall of the house for about 20 feet or so. And at this point, it's, there's a seven foot high wall. And then it drops down to 5.5 feet and back up to 10 feet over here. And that's as a plane is dropping this direction. Ordinarily, as a landscape architect, I would not recommend draining towards the house. Uh, they have to actually cut this two and a half feet back in order to be able to apply the waterproofing at that point. I have another concern, having been a volunteer fireman on Engine 31 on Ebbs Road for many years, about 30, 40 years ago, <laughs> I have some personal experience. And what would happen is Engine 31 would be the first engine in. It would pull in here, and it's to get, they, they can't get through here. This was my original concern that kind of started this whole thing, was my concern that there was, that a fireman can't get around to, to this side of the house without going all the way around. There's a car, secondary car required by the city parking lot, parking spot there. So an engine would pull up, they would pull, they'd have to pull the hose around to, to get to this side of the house. The main sources of fire in a residence are garage, kitchen, and then the natural area above. So what happens, assuming that this is the kitchen, there's a main source of fire there, this is the master bedroom, so it's, it's quite possible that in this case they would have to come around to fight the fire from here and here. They have to pull a hose 200 feet. They wouldn't drive an engine further up this way because they, they don't have a hammerhead turnaround. They could back the engine here and get out in a, in a fire condition. Uh, I've been out in fires. I was about, I lived about 30 seconds from the engine company, and I, I was on the tailboard a lot. And in one of my experiences, I was standing uh, in the old part of town on a Saturday afternoon when they had a fireman's picnic, and there was a skeleton crew, and I got on the back of the tailboard, and there was a grass fire up in the old part of town with a lot of exposures around. And... Um, it was quite an experience. Uh, we pulled in what they call a, a pump and drive type thing, and fire was coming at me, and I'm supposed to yell water, and, they, and they're supposed to start the pumping, and I pulled the lever back and called water, and I got drip, 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 and the engine was sitting on top of the hose. <laughs> so, mm. um, standing right next to me was a full-grown Quercus lobata, and the fire didn't come up to the, to the foliage, the skirt of the foliage, but that tree suddenly, as the fire came up there, that suddenly that tree blew up. Just, I mean, just blew up like a bomb. Boom! And caught on fire. So I'm concerned about the tree remaining here and this source of fire here. Uh, if uh, this is a very volatile native vegetation, and we've got a, an oak tree above here and an oak tree here, once it comes down and becomes a crown fire, it'll explode this tree, and you've got a problem. So I think it's... My concern about the fire, uh, con about not having an access around the house through here was the original thing that kind of started all this. So there's, I have a lot of other data, but I don't want to waste your time with a lot of information that probably you can ask questions and I'll be prepared to speak to that. Uh, questions, Commissioner Reynolds. Good evening, Mr. Dean. Good evening. How long would it take one of these 15-gallon trees that they will be replanting if this is removed to grow to the size of this tree? That, I, my guess is that's probably 35 years. So that tree in might that, be about that 35 that years condition. old or so? Pardon? The tree is under 40 years old. Hard to say, but I, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, that was a, a John kind of hit the mitigation as being 15 gallons because the tree's not available in the, uh, it's not a commercially available tree, very, very hard to get. If you're lucky, you can find 15 gallons. My recommendation, my concern is 
planting those trees up in here with that reverse condition, 16 inches of the good soil, and then the parent material below that, and then goes down to, to the uh, rocky condition below. My concern is I don't think the species in general will, will grow there. Mm. You put 15 gallons in there and you think you've done it and, and you don't. I don't, if they, were, if they were suitable to that area, you'd see more of them. There's only one tree. I've, I've never seen another one in that local so area. So you're not recommending that they be planted then on this property or this development? I think, the, I think it's not a good idea. Mm. I don't think it's going to be successful. In my mind, you'd be better served planting, and I think the developer is willing to do that, plant four 24-inch box of oaks. Mm -hmm. The oaks are suitable and they do grow there. That would be, in my mind, a better, a right. better uh, recommendation. Well, I know a black walnut is a coveted wood. Beautiful and... They're very pretty and in the right setting. You know, they're mo mostly found on north-facing slopes where there's, um, the soil holds the water for a longer period of time and they are shallow rooted and they go long distances. If you look at this one, if you look at the area of the tree right along here, they've cut some, uh, at, at the drip line, they've cut some probably four inch roots and just mm -hmm. left them. Uh, they didn't do it, it was kind of brutal. They didn't actually cut the roots. They actually came in with a tractor and is it a tree then where the roots grow shallow so it really is a hindrance to landscaping or walkways? No, I think it would I think the tree a tree plant on the site would would be compatible with other plants around it. There's enough soil there. Oh, okay. If the tree remains, then I really recommend that it be irrigated. Thank you. Unlike an oak tree. Other questions? Commissioner Turpel? Uh, good evening, Mr. Dean. Hi. Uh, did I understand that y your feeling was that if the 13 walnut trees were replaced in that particular area, your feeling of their survival would not be good? Is that what I heard? I, my, I can't, I, I don't base it on anything except that, that the, if you look at the uh, soil conservation uh, soil report on what it is, which, by the way, is interesting because they just come out with this tool. You can take your, so your phone stand right in a certain location and and press a button and they'll it'll SCS will tell you what that soil is and okay I want one of those can yeah, I get it's one available of those? all you have to do is <laughs> take it so it's the uh, but um, the my my belief is that the city would be better served if we planted four oak trees um, I think th those we know for sure will grow in that soil you've seen them up on the hill and I think everybody would be better served if we if we don't try to force the um, walnuts. I, don't, it, it, I think the conditions for that specific tree, again, if you look at the, you go right down to here and you look at, looking up, you'll see these vertical um, layers, which tells me there was a volcanic condition there or, or a, uh, some kind of a folding that occurred geologically and reversed it so the parent materials on top and the uh, Good soil is down below, pretty deep, and I think that's the condition that supported that one tree, and why there's no other ones around it. Because if you look at the rest of it where they've cut it, you have about 16 inches of good clay loam, and then you have that hard, um, hard material below. I don't think that you're going to find a condition where we're planting those slopes. I don't think you're going to find a condition where those trees are going to survive. That's my personal belief. I don't know what John thinks about that, but. And John, <laughs> but that's my personal opinion based on my experience. You're talking about the new trees. I pardon. You're talking about the new trees. Yeah, any replacements. Sort of, yeah. I think, in my mind, should not be walnut. I don't see that. Even if if we could find four 15-gallon walnuts, it's worth a try. But I don't think it's going to be successful. I think the conditions of the soil are wrong. Okay, thanks, mm -hmm. Commissioner Price. Yes, <clears throat> just a point of clarification. In your photograph here that you took, um, it, it, uh, you've got the number 384 written on there, yet the documents that we have from Three, staff are 385? I'm yeah, I'm sorry, the 384 was the original, uh, I used, I had that picture from way before, and I just picked it and used it in, as 384 in my oak tree report, or my tree report. I see. And that was taken, uh, in my computer I could go back and show the date of the, fo of the photograph, and the two photographs, and they're almost identical, almost exactly a year apart. 
Okay, I guess my point is that we're talking about the same tree that in the report from staff is called 385, and that is, in fact, the photograph here that you have marked 384. I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, I, I visited the site, and um, I, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out uh, how access was going to be uh, obtained to that particular lot. Do, do you happen to have a, um, a tract map? That um, I don't have anything. I don't think I have anything that small. I think Lori does. I, I think you've answered part of the question by showing a fire truck there on, on yeah. your diagram there. There's a long driveway, and it's kind of an unusual condition because usually the first engine in tries to knock the fire down. The second engine comes in, takes a hydrant, pulls it up to the first engine, and attaches and uh, ha have a steady flow of water. This is a very, very <coughs> deep lot. And I'm not. Sh I'm sure the fire department probably approved it because there was an adequate hammerhead with this driveway, which is really deep. There's an adequate hammerhead for him to get back in there and turn around. They're very sensitive about that. Fire department is very sensitive about that. Now, if um, if the commission were to vote to in favor uh, of your permit, what would your plan be? Would you just completely knock down that grade that down to level? Well, I think. I, uh, let's, let's take the worst case scenario and let's say that we depend on the tree living and the tree dies. We've left that homeowner with a, a mess. And uh, in my mind, it would be better to complete the grading in a normal way, move the house more towards the slope. I think it would require probably a 10 foot setback from tow or something in that order. It would free up the backyard and, and everything would be better. Let's put it that way. So the placement of the, the uh, pad on this particular lot is somewhat contingent upon the outcome here tonight. Is that correct? Yes. And, you know, I want to point out that I went through a little scenario. I have long, long notes, but I'm not going to use it. But um, if we were to, uh, let's say we're going to bring in a tree company to transplant that tree, the cost of that size box tree would be approximately $18,000 plus some, maybe even 20,000 in replanting a tree, and without, probably without any, a guarantee. We're spending, I'm told, I, don't, I haven't verified this, but I'm told that we're spending about $35,000 to save the tree. Again, assuming that the tree doesn't make it, and I'm not gonna say it's going to or not going to, uh, there's a lot of energy left in the tree and it's possible the tree would survive. But if it didn't, we've left that homeowner with a real mess on their hands, they can never it would cost so much money to knock the walls down to have a front yard that uh, I, I can't see anybody in that price home doing that, having the money to do that. So it's kind of a logical, this is, comes down to, in my opinion, uh, what's, what's the logical thing to do here? And how is the community affected by the loss of the tree? And I, I'm one who, I've been working with oak trees since uh, I came to Thousand Oaks, and I think around 66. And uh, I'm not one to want to take a tree out, but this, the, the common sense here kind of drives me to say that we should, we should uh, take that route. And, and the, I'm sure the developer would have funds then available to, trans, to uh, replace the tree with an oak tree or something that's more suitable. Yeah. There, are, <clears throat> there are other compelling factors that, uh, that need to be weighed here too. So, sure, um, I understand. I guess my question, I'm not sure you answered it, and, but if, say, the commission were to uh, uh, vote for the removal of that tree, uh, yes. give you the ability to remove that tree, would you then, you would then lose this hillside there and regrade that area there and move the uh, pad? You would move the house more forward on the lot. You'd have more backyard, more usable backyard. Um, I think I don't think it's an issue of because they've gotten they've got an approval they can build it as it is now But did we hamstring them with something that we thought was going to be a better way to go? I know the Planning Commission. I wasn't here, but, but the Planning Commission went four to one with one person uh, Really wanting to save the tree and I think we lacked the third dimension in that process Not sure that everybody envisioned what's going to have to be done to save the tree so in order to do the plan as approved, uh, in order to waterproof that wall, we have to cut, I'm told, we have to cut it back a two and a half foot more for a person access to get in to, to build the wall and then to uh, waterproof it. 
um, and it's an interior space, so you want to really do that right. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is really a question, maybe more sure. of a statement. Um, at least looking at the tree report, it looks like it's a relatively healthy tree. Um, the roots are shallow. Two sites are already cut out. It looks like a, again, to me, it looks like it's an easy transplant. It's in, I'm sorry. I said it uh, looks like an easy transplant uh, with the current condition, shallow roots, and uh, particularly there's no commercially available walnut trees. Yes, that's so true. I, at least right this second, I'm, I'm looking more towards transplant. I agree that uh, based on what you presented that uh, the tree needs to go, but um, I'm not convinced that the tree uh, needs to go forever. <clears throat> and uh, probably for the other commissioners, uh, in, whether it's a transplant or uh, several other replacement trees, they don't have to be replaced on the property itself. Could be anywhere in the city. So um, uh, the concern about planting on that site, um, I, don't, I don't see that as a, uh, as a concern. Sure. I, do you want me, can I answer that? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing this a very long time, transplanted a lot of trees. I transplanted the oak tree right outside the uh, Civic Center here, the big oak tree uh, at a co huge cost, and the tree is still surviving. Um, and there was a lot of concern that that would not happen. That tree has been now over five years planted, transplanted five years. If you look at it compared to the other trees um, that are, were not transplanted, it's pretty much in the same condition. Um, I can't, the problem I have with that, I've, we have to predict these things and have to take responsibility for them. And in my experience, I don't have anything to back up a decision to transplant it. We can certainly certainly explore that if that's your call. Um, it, my guess is it was gonna, it's gonna cost about somewhere in the neighborhood of $18,000 to box it. The one out here was I think 90,000, the oak was 90,000, weighed 190,000 pounds. Um, so I can't say with certainty the tree is going to survive. Now it's a matter of do we invest the $18,000 in that single tree or do we do something else that probably has a better chance of, of turning out positive? I, don't, I can't really answer that question. I, I have not done that. I have not called anybody out to take a look at it, but it's worth, I mean, if that's what your call is, we certainly can do that and let the, let the two biggest companies who normally transplant trees s speak to it. Uh, let them bid on it and speak to it and because they're going to probably, if I was spending $18,000, I'd want some sort of guarantee. And I don't think that they can do that because there's not a lot of experience in that specific species of tree. I don't have any place to go to check to see if it, was, it would be successful. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Reynolds. Um, so if the tree is, let's say, transplanted, then no replacement trees will be put on the property? The, I, I don't know. I think that's your call. Or it's your okay. Call, or so call. let's say if the tree is removed, you were suggesting instead of three 15-gallon, put in four oak trees on the property. On the property. What size box? I'm sorry, what? What size box oak um, trees? I would think if you're going to put them in the slope, probably 24. Anything above, above that is hard to get the planting pocket. Okay. Um, so you're really recommending removal of the tree and four oak trees replaced on the property, 24-inch box. Well, I, you know, uh, to be very honest with you, I'm here to bring facts before you. I think that's really your call, not mine. Uh, I don't like to remove trees. Um, I've been here 44 years in Thousand Oaks. I've seen a lot of trees growing, and I've watched them grow. Um, I have serious concern about that tree surviving. Okay, but you point. think that oak and trees would survive better on the property is yes, what you had said too. Yeah, I'm answering an earlier question about the health of the tree. If you look at the two, the two different pictures I've sent to you, they were taken a year apart. The tree is suffering from a chronic water deficit. Mm -hmm. Now, is that curable? 
uh, if they're gonna if they're gonna cut back two and a half feet and we allow that to happen, now we're See, two and a half yeah. feet from eight, that's six I don't, I don't th really think our discussion is to save the tree at that spot. We're more concerned removing it and it's gone or removing it to transplant it. I think that seems like the questions we've been asking you, and that's yeah. what I was well, getting I think, over after as far as what to replace it with. I, I think we're talking about a gamble. You know, yeah. is it reasonable to spend $18,000 yeah. or $20,000 to take right. a chance on that tree right. surviving? I'm not the right. total But it's expert. not our concern as far as the cost or whatever I know. That's yeah. not in our I understand purview. That. So. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Dean. Uh, Mr. Town, you have some comments. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few comments with regard to what we're discussing in mitigation. The uh, landmark ordinance in the municipal code provides for either the replacement of a tree that's removed or its transplantation. Sure. And that can occur either on or off site. Sure. The uh, landmark tree ordinance does not have a specified ratio of replacement trees sure. to remove trees. So yes. that is really within the purview of the commission to determine what it feels is the appropriate, normally, appropriate number of trees to be planted as mitigation. Normally, if species A is removed, then species A is replanted. Right. You know, what we're hearing uh, from the applicant is, you know, remove species A and plant species B. Um, that may be appropriate for that particular site. There's nothing in the ordinance that mandates that it be the same species. So you also have a little bit of flexibility there. I just want to say for the record, it's, it's unusual. It's not, not out of your jurisdiction though. So either transplanting on or off site, replacement on or off site, or even theoretically a different species. Sure. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Dean. We'll okay, go thank you very much. back to staff for any follow-up comments. Um, we have John Innes here, who's the city's landscape um, tree consultant, and uh, he might be able to respond to some of the questions regarding whether to replace it with the oak trees or... Yes, let me, let me address a couple of those things, and anything I miss you can bring up again. Uh, the issue of, of transplanting, uh, we certainly agree with what Jim Dean has said about that, and that is that um, we could not find any, any company who has dealt with transplanting walnut trees. Uh, that said, you certainly could hire a company to transplant the walnut tree, but like Jim said, that would be with a, a no guarantee situation. And our normal of uh, <clears throat> transplanting uh, scenario is that if the tree doesn't survive it needs to be replaced with the same size tree well in this particular case you can't do that so we're sort of back in the in the uh, in the in the same dilemma um, so th that is a huge unknown be transplanting that tree now the the new trees uh, would be in a uh, quite a different situation than, than this tree is in, in that they would have a, an irrigation system. Whether we put them on a, a bubbler or a drip system up in the, uh, up in the open space area or whether we put them on a slope with the, with the rest of the landscaping. Um, either of those situations, they would get uh, water just like they're getting now uh, in their uh, nursery situation that they're, that they're growing up in. Um, and like Mark Town said, uh, there's there's not a requirement that it be the same species, but it's it's uh, it's been our policy that we have the same species replacement of what we remove, whether it be the the coast live oak or the or the valley oak or the or the toyon or the or the walnut, and the walnut doesn't occur very often, and and unfortunately, uh, yeah, that brings us back to that situation of the the trees are not readily available, and uh, and. It, it's we're not even positive that we can we can get four 15 gallon trees it may, it may be the end of the day that those would have to drop to, to five gallon trees in which case we would normally uh, increase that amount because these trees are not normal landscape trees um, they are uh, usually only used in uh, the new plantings that are used now are in uh, re-establishing uh, riparian areas and uh, the nurseries that do grow them on a regular basis, they're, they're quite small, either just really seedlings or one gallon size, sometimes five gallon size. So we're not even positive that we can get the 15 gallon size. 
Um, you know, that said, back to commenting on uh, Mr. Dean's comments about would the oak trees be better? Well, we certainly know that they're very tough and we've had incredible success with the agrifolias, uh, both in uh, both of these areas that I described, where they would go out in open space with, with, a, with a bubbler or whether they go right into a, a regular uh, irrigated landscape. They're very, very successful species. So from that standpoint, uh, that's a safer bet, but let's go back to the whole purpose of, the, of our landmark uh, uh, ordinance, and that is to protect these, these species and, and realize that these things are, are unique. And so to, to, uh, to see them lost and changed to another species, I, I certainly think that we should try to, uh, to plant the walnuts and to uh, uh, perpetuate this species in this particular area. Um, now, like Mr. Dean said, you look up on the hillside and you don't see clusters of walnuts up here. But there are, there is a, a, a grove of walnuts not far from here, just over, just over the hill. So they, they can occur in this area. They just don't happen to right here. And why, why this one is here, you know, who knows for sure. It, it certainly had, uh, like, like Jim suggested, good soil opportunity. Uh, and it may have had some some water that we don't know of at, at the particular time when it was when it was growing up that's not obvious to us now. So anyway, uh, gone around on on those things. And if you have any other questions, I could a attempt to answer them. Commissioner Turpel. Good evening, Mr. Rennes. Um, would you agree um, with what Mr. Dean said that the. Uh, the uh, the chances of transplanted or new planting of walnut trees up in that area would have a, a a chance of not surviving. Would you be would that be a big question for you? Transplanting this this particular I'm sorry, tree. I'm, I misspoke. I'm talking about if we put new walnut trees in that area, do you think they would survive? Yes, you do. I do. Like I said, they would be on an on an irrigation system, and uh, I would expect them to survive. Okay, with the, the other question is uh, the applicant said in, in, in our packet that uh, from previous grading that, the, that the, the roots have been cut on this particular tree. Do you think that really affects the, the health of this particular tree and its survivability in the future? No, I don't. Uh, if, if that were to occur today or if, if, this were, if, if I had gone out there and they said that <clears throat> this, this uh, grading was done last week, I'd be horrified. I don't know if any of you that have gone out there, but it's a horrific cut that was made on this this large root <clears throat> on uh, one of the corners of, of the uh, where the cuts were made. Um, and looking at it, would not expect the tree to survive or go into a, a major shock. But this was done in in 2007, early 2008, possibly. So this tree has had many growing seasons since that time. And you can see how it looks today. Uh, it was rated as a, uh, a B appearance and, and C health, which we agree with. It's a, it's a very nice tree. And so um, I don't see that that root damage will be a, a, a problem in, in the future. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question maybe for Mr. Town, if you could answer this. Um, we're, we're talking about, uh, Mr. Dean talked about actually putting in oak trees instead and we can put them all over the city. I mean, that's our purview. Can we mix and match this stuff? Can we put oak trees somewhere and then some of the walnut trees elsewhere? Uh, uh, you could. You could. Uh, again, if you're planting on site, we, we've heard comments about open space. Uh, and perhaps um, Mr. Ernst can comment on this as well. But within or surrounding this tract and within this property will be a fuel modification zone, which will be landscape irrigated to provide for fire protection between the developed uh, pads and the adjacent true open space. When we talk about open space, that may be an appropriate place to plant these, these new replacement trees if the commission goes that route. They would not actually be planted out in the natural open space. That, that never has irrigation, et cetera. That's They'd be in my backyard. They'd be in your backyard. <laughs> they'd, they'd be in this manufactured, planted, irrigated yeah, sure. slope behind the houses. So, um, you know, again, maybe Mr. Innes can comment on that, but that is typically 
where these would be planted unless there's a, a, a better landscape area within the track where they could be located. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, no other questions. We'll go back to uh, the applicant uh, for any final comments. Uh, Mr. Dean, you have five minutes. Oversell. Um, I'm trying to keep this factual, but the um, if we if we continue as it is, uh, and we we go ahead and build the walls against the house, which I don't recommend, and the fire department has already told Lori, we, they've also told me that they're going to make a, us do a vertical cut. Basically, half of that tree is gone for fire for fire prevention. Uh, we're going to have to move two and a half feet back into the slope, cut two and a half feet according to the grading contractor in order to build and to waterproof the wall. Um, so what happens is we're, we don't have much of a tree left. Um, there is definitely, uh, if you look at those two pictures I shared with you, there's definitely the tree is declining and it's declining slowly. Uh, what happens is it has a water deficit so what it's done is dropping back to a level that it can st sustain itself and so you're losing a lot of foliage. This time of year we're at the, uh, we're starting into a little growing period and going back into where it'll be de deciduous. And I would think that in spring, the tree will come out and look really good for a short time. And then again, it can't, it'll drop back to a level that it can support with the amount of root that's available. So it's a declining process. Can the tree be saved in place? Uh, if we didn't do anything, I would recommend watering the tree. It's a tree that does require water, unlike oak trees. And I think it would probably take some years for it to recover those lost roots. And, and John is totally right. It was a brutal, it was a brutal job that they did out there and uh, didn't do it correctly. But that's, um, that's pretty much it. Again, my, I would like to tell you that the, <clears throat> uh, I've talked with the client and, um, they would be willing to, um, to either donate or transplant a, a replacement oak tree at a cost of not to exceed $2,000, which would be a pretty good sized tree, and plant the four or five or 10 uh, walnut trees and see what happens. I don't have a lot of hope for them because again, the uniqueness of this particular tree or this particular root environment is that um, it's reversed. This is a, 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 lo a loam. It's a, a, it's a loam soil, which is ideal soil, and it has everything perfect to support it. Uh, when you plant it up and up in the wild area above, we, we even willing to take sprinklers up to it. It's got 16 inches of soil, and then you get into the uh, parent material, which is not well drained. The the um, loam is well drained and becomes uh, almost if this were back, they had not cut this like this. The roots are way out in, in, way out beyond the drip line, and it's got this reservoir of water where there's, at this time of year, you would have about 17% moisture retained. I've always wondered how these trees survive. There's about a seven, it's been shown in Ben Johnson, we measured it, that in September we have about a 17, a uniform level of moisture in the soil, about 17%. 25% is considered uh, uh, field capacity. So I, I think the tree would gradually decline if we were going to cut it back the two and a half feet to, to do the waterproofing then I would suggest that those all those roots are cut clean and uh, the backfill would be a rich uh, some kind of a rich material uh, other than the gravel for the drain um, that would allow the tree to, to survive. So um, it's not an ideal situation. I did want to show you, uh, and if I could pass this up to him, um, this is a picture. This photo was taken about 25 feet down the driveway, and it's, uh, it's the vertical um, geological incident or whatever it is that uh, caused that to shift and, and reverse the having the material, the print material on top and the uh, loam below. So the parent material is the basis for the soil that's there. And that was taken about roughly 20 or 30 feet 
as you're facing the tree or facing the slope down the slope down the driveway. Uh, it's kind of interesting phenomenon. But I, I think that concludes our points of view. I do have, well, you've seen all that. I do have any, I can answer any more questions or we can cut it off at that. Questions of the applicant? No additional questions. Thank yes. you, Mr. Dean. Yes. No, we don't have any additional questions for you. You do have no we additional? Don't. Okay, thank do you not. so much. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Okay, we'll close the public hearing, open for commission discussion and or a motion. Commissioner Turpel. Well, my thought on, on this is um, these are always kind of, um, I hate to use the word emotional, but I believe that it, it's proper. I'm really concerned about the future homeowner on this site and, and making sure that that home that they're living in is uh, is going to be something that they're going to be able to enjoy. And apparently, if the if the tree remains there, it's going to be it's going to be probably not as a popular piece of property as the as the surrounding areas. So, but one of the things that I heard in in, in difference was that uh, Mr. Ennis says that he thinks that the walnut trees can exist there, and will grow there and thrive there. That's what I heard. Um, I also heard the applicant say they're willing to move to oak trees. I, I'm leaning to see, and I don't know what the rest of the commission thinks on this, is trying to create a mix that if, if the oak trees are more, much more vibrant in the area and then have a mix of the other walnut trees put throughout the city somewhere else um, or even on the property. Um, because as um, Mr. Dean said, it, you know, it is a, you're taking a gamble as to how all this stuff goes. And, you know, frankly, I have trouble keeping grass growing in, in my yard, so I have to yield to the uh, the professionals. So um, I would like us to see the move towards something where we have a combination, remove the tree, um, not put the expenditure into actually replacing it, and seeing somehow if we can put some oak trees on the property and then and get the seedlings, if we can find them, uh, put towards uh, the other uh, uh grove of walnut trees that Mr. Ennis was uh, was uh, relating to. So those are my thoughts at this time. Other comments? Commissioner Price. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're left with uh, a decision that's really, a, in my view, kind of a non-decision in that, that uh, if this tree were to remain there, we're going to do further damage to it in order to build this house regardless. Um, and, and that just doesn't seem like a wise move I, th I think we'd uh, what we'd have to do in order to keep it in place would be to the detriment of that tree and eventually it'd be removed anyway so um, I, I am however uh, I love walnut trees I grew up with them in the San Fernando Valley and I remember my grandparents had a big one in their backyard a couple of them actually and they were big beautiful trees um, I would be in favor of seeing if we could not uh, or we could find these 15 gallon walnuts and replace them as staff has recommended with 15 gallon walnut trees on the premises there on, in the open spaces uh, uh, as was suggested um, so that's that's uh, those are my thoughts commissioner reynolds i think that commissioner price is really going with staff recommendation remove the tree and replace with uh, three walnut trees and I have to agree with the same uh, it would be nice if we could if it could be transplanted but I think um, I'm not sure that it would really survive and I would like to see the trees replanted within the area because apparently I don't know if this was a grove at one time or if it just have to be happened to be one tree that ended there because of the squirrels or the crows or something you know, starting its growth. But uh, I have to agree with Commissioner Price and my husband's family had a beautiful, huge one in the front yard that I know was removed at one time. But um, I have to go along with, I think, the staff's recommendation then. And if you want, I'll make a motion or Commissioner well, Fisher. I'll go ahead and make comments and okay. you can take it from there. Okay. Um, I'm probably just gonna repeat what I said earlier. Um, this is a native tree. 
Uh, yes, yeah. any transplant, whether it's this or an oak, uh, is a gamble. Um, my daughter always tells me, go big or go home, Dad. <laughs> so um, I'm going big. Uh, I think it's a, I think out of all the trees that we've seen since I've been on the commission, um, I think this is probably the best one I've seen that uh, would have a chance at surviving. I mean, it's the roots are shallow. Uh, two sides are already dug away. Um, it seemed to survive uh, uh, the butcher job that took place at that site. So, um, and the availability of these trees um, is a concern. So, um, you know, my thoughts are I, I think it's a good candidate for a uh, transplant. Um, back to Commissioner Reynolds. Well, I think maybe Mr. Tapel should talk first, only because I think you've convinced me. That's why I always come into these meetings with my Trapel. mind is never made up, and I can yeah. be swayed. Well, my my, you know, I, I'm concurring with everybody here, except that the biggest thing that I'm thinking about is, that I heard that hit me hard is that it's going to be hard, difficult to find 15 gallon um, walnut trees. Um, and I'm concerned that we, if we go forward with this type of a decision, the way staff has put it, that we won't be able to find them. So my position is, is to see if we could find some mitigating aspects. I don't mind transplanting the tree at all. That doesn't bother me at all. But the, um, my concern is the, the future homeowner. Um, it's going to encumber the, the way that, that house is going to be positioned on the lot. And I believe in personal property rights, and I want good projects out there. Um, so I don't, I don't mind the idea of the tree being transplanted if, if, if they think it can be done properly. But my biggest concern is if we go for the 15 gallons or the what was it, 13, 15 gallon walnut trees, that they won't be able to find them. And then what do we do? Um, I think uh, I think we're all saying the same thing that uh, for reasonable use of the property, the tree has to be removed. We all agree with that. Um, uh, my point was I think it can be transplanted, not necessarily on site, but off site uh, somewhere else in the city. Uh, but I do agree that, yeah, for reasonable use of this property, the tree does need to be removed. Commissioner Trapel. The, if we, even if we transplant it, though, I think that there should be some condition that we, we plant um, you know, replace more trees on that particular property. It's a gorgeous tree. We've all been there, you know. Uh, Mr. Town. D just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, if the commission is, is thinking about uh, transplanting the tree, one idea would be to, um, first of all, reopen the hearing and pass this idea by the applicant so that they can comment on it again. But perhaps consider uh, continuing this item to a date certain to October 10th, which is one month away, so that um, an evaluation can be made of the idea of transplanting it, as Mr. Dean mentioned, to acquire a couple of, of uh, professional evaluations of that to see if, in fact, that is a viable alternative. And that would, I think, give the commission the information that it needs to uh, evaluate that option. So that's one suggestion. Well, I guess we can see which way the commission is hedging, then we may need to reopen it. Commissioner Trapel. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Fisher. The, uh, is that also possible to, for, for staff to be able to find out if these uh, 13, 15 gallon, <laughs> is it 13? Uh, 16, 27, I don't it's, know, whatever the number is. Uh, okay, six. hold on. Okay, thank you. It's 615 gallon. Okay, good. Juglins, you know, California. I didn't That's, watch Sesame Street enough as a kid. So. <laughs> and, and just on that point, another, another suggestion, we could uh, modify the language of condition number four, which is landmark tree replacement, to read along the lines of landmark tree number 385 shall be replaced with 615 gallon nursery grown, nursery grown Druglands Californica or Quercus agrifolia if the Juglands is not available. So you could replace it at the same size or even uh, massage that size, but we could add language to say 
If the walnuts are not available in 15 gallon, then to replace with uh, Quercus agrifolia, which is the coast live oak, and it's the more hardy of the two species for this site. Any additional discussion? Do we need to do we need to um, reopen to uh, get the applicant? Mr. Norman. I, it may be better to have a motion on the table first. Someone should probably make a motion and then from there we can, right, and then from there we can decide whether we want to reopen. Commissioner Reynolds. Uh, I would like to move that we continue this hearing to a date certain of October 10th for the uh, study of the transplant of this tree and, the and also the availability of 15 gallon um, black walnuts. I don't know if that's enough time to do that type of. Okay. And that's my motion. Okay, let's, uh, with the motion, let's go ahead and reopen the public hearing, give the applicant a chance to respond to that. Thank you. Um, you did? Yeah. Where? The greater. Okay. I don't. I didn't know that. Um, it's that's certainly within your purview. The problem that we're facing right now is that the grading equipment is right in the middle of grading, and to put them off and have them offset and come back again, we're, we're talking about a lot of a lot of. Everybody's being hurt a lot by that. The $35,000 in walls goes up considerably. Uh, I would like to propose that, um, and we'll do this very in a very careful way, that if uh, we'll bring out uh, Senatry Company, Valley Crest, the two big people, and have them independently give an opinion as to whether they can transplant the trees, and that could be done in a week. And... Um, and I, if, we're, if there's a general consensus the tree has to come out, then the issue turns out to be, can we transplant the tree? Again, I have no experience in that species of knowing that if it can or cannot be done. But there's two big companies. The uh, Senna Company transplanted the oak forest out here. And uh, in, in a week, we could find out for sure. And also, we could determine whether those... Um, trees are available. The, uh, again, the owner is willing to um, commit to a $2,500 tree, oak tree, that will, no matter what, will throw in. And uh, I'd like to have it be able to come back to some kind of administrative decision, if possible, as to whether we can transplant the tree or not. If we, ha if we can, we will. But I think it's a poor I would like to turn those two people loose, those two companies loose, and, and ask them to guarantee it and see what happens. Because uh, if the tree dies, uh, uh, would you be willing to come back in two weeks? We have a hearing already scheduled uh, that you could start before. Yes. Yeah, that, I think that would be reasonable, and in that two-week period, for sure, I would like I would like those two um, independent opinions, not coerced in any way, two independent opinions as to whether the species can take it, and can they transplant the tree somewhere. I don't know that there's a place on site for it, but let's say transplant the tree with some kind of a guarantee or reasonable guarantee that the tree is going to make it, and I I, I think we're going to fall short of having a lot of experience. I don't, I've been 44 years, I've never seen one transplanted before, so I don't know that it cannot be done. But uh, yes, we could, we'd be willing to, uh, to do that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dean. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead okay, and close I'll, the public. Um, I'll change on. my motion and restate Commissioner the motion. Commissioner Reynolds, hold on. I'm sorry. We need to close the public hearing. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll, the. Uh, Restate the motion and change it that we will continue this meeting to a date certain of September 26th 
and at that time it, to have evaluation of transplanting the black walnut and the availability of six uh, 15 gallon replacement black walnuts. Okay, comments to the motion? Vote, vote please. Motion passed, 4-0. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to our next item, uh, Community Development Department, Mr. Town. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, department reports for you tonight. The first one has to do with uh, general plan consistency determination regarding the uh, proposed disposition of two parcels owned by the Kenneho Valley Unified School District. And this is uh, to, to confirm that that disposition is in conformity with the uh, Thousand Oaks General Plan, which is required by state law, that determination. And for this particular item, uh, Mr. Jeff Spector, senior planner, will be presenting it. We're just loading the PowerPoint uh, at this time. Uh, Mr. Spector, ready when you are. Yeah. I don't know if we can take a, a moment, but the PowerPoint's not on this uh, directory here. So unless it was uh, mislabeled. Be that. No. Not on here. Mr. Town, should we take a break? Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute recess. Okay, we will reconvene the Planning Commission meeting of September 12th, 2011. Uh, Mr. Town. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Instead of hearing item uh, 7A right now, while that's being uh, loaded onto the computer, we're going to go ahead to uh, item 7B, which is an overview of the 2011 update to the Ventura County Technical Guidance Manual for Stormwater Quality Control Measures. This is simply for the Commission's information. It's not a, an item for your vote, uh, and it is described on page 43 of your packet. And uh, tonight we have uh, John Shepard, Planning Division Manager, to present along with Mr. Jim Taylor, one of our senior engineers and a hydrologist to boot. So uh, I'll take it away, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Mr. Taylor and I are here tonight to uh, present a brief overview of the 2010 uh, Ventura County Municipal uh, Separate Storm Sewer System Permit and the 2011 Technical Guidance Manual. Uh, that will go into effect on October 11, 2011. The stormwater measures required by the uh, 2010 permit uh, will be incorporated into future projects, uh, including some of the projects that you'll be seeing in the future here um, before the commission. However, it uh, should be noted that the uh, local permitting agency does not have discretionary uh, review for implementation of these requirements. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, turn the presentation over to uh, Mr. Taylor. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Shepard, and good evening, Chair Fisher and Commissioners. As John said, we're under a new MPDES permit or National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. You can tell by its nomenclature that it's federal in nature and, ha and it will have acronyms all over it. 
Uh, as of July 8th of 2010, we were given this new permit with the uh, requirements to develop a revision to the old technical guidance manual that we had developed back in July of 2002. The new technical guidance manual will be effective as of October 11th this year, and at that time, folks will be subject to its requirements, folks that are doing projects. The uh, old manual in 2002 that I mentioned earlier has been revised to kind of step up the requirements a little bit. Now, uh, there, were, there were two things that were covered under the old uh, permit. One had to do with the amount of water that came off of a site, which had to be limited to a certain amount. Now, it's been revised to a zero discharge. No water may leave the site for most of the storms throughout the entire year. That means that we have to find some way to either use the water on site or make it soak into the ground. The other requirement has to do with making sure that we clean the water before it gets down into the riverine waterways. And so we're still having to deal with scrubbing the water clean as well as reducing or actually in this case practically eliminating the amount of water that's running off the site. So we have to include some kind of a capture component. As indicated on the slide there, um, we're, we're focused on something called um, hydro modification, and that is a uh, phenomenon whereas uh, when you modify the watershed from a natural state that has vegetation and raw soils and you turn it into rooftops and streets, it tends to become more voluminous. The amount of water that falls on it doesn't soak in anymore. And then in addition to that, it's no longer laden with sediments and vegetation. It's pretty clean, relatively clean, although it's full of all of our uh, development uh, pollutants that might be deposited on asphalt surfaces and so forth. So we have a, a problem with hydro modification. The water comes down into contact with riverine bodies and scours them to a point where they're damaged. So we have to mitigate that by making sure that whenever we develop property nowadays, that there is no water coming off of the site. Now we've already developed in this watershed to an extensive degree, so the amount that we can do with the additional development we have available and the amount of redevelopment is in question, but the requirements are very firm from the regional board and we're subject to them. So tonight I'm gonna go over some of those requirements and kind of show you some of the ideas we have on how to make that possible. Uh, one of the facets of Implementation has to do with developing more things in the terms of smart growth, that is clustering development and also um, making communities more walkable, possibly combined use of uh, commercial with residential. Also, uh, there are some specific criteria for redevelopment, which I'll get into in a moment. As far as the proper design of the BMPs um, that are required, uh, the, uh, the focus has to be on the ultimate maintenance of those facilities. If, if a facility is buried under the ground, as we've seen in the last 20 years of stormwater mitigation, it gets forgotten and people forget to maintain it. If you're using landscaped areas and above ground type of means for mitigating stormwater, they're naturally going to be maintained. So the first thing that you think about is maintenance. The second thing is this list of bullets that are in front of you, which prioritize the focus on trying to reduce or eliminate the amount of runoff, specifically the infiltration and so forth. And I'll have some slides to talk about some of the alternatives for doing that. Some of the exceptions, uh, some folks can actually um, uh, obtain some sort of a grandfathering, if you will, uh, if they um, have already been deemed complete by the time that this technical guidance manual goes into effect in October. Uh, there's also some specific wording in the permit that recognizes the term deemed complete as a CEQA reserved def definition. And uh, Mar or, or John, I think you had something to say about that. It just says uh, to augment uh, Mr. Taylor's comments here as far as the importance of uh, this, uh, the first and second exception that you see on the uh, the slide here, um, you know, the exceptions, of course, are projects that are accepted as complete is the terminology we use. Of course, CEQA calls it deemed complete. Um, that the application itself has to be accepted for processing before that October 11th date. Um, and if it is, then uh, it's subject actually to the, uh, the older SQUIMP requirements of the 2000 permit, as I understand that. Um, and this applies to, uh, so the project itself doesn't have to 
be approved prior to the October 11th. It's the application processing that needs to come in. And this is anything from a development permit to from a, uh, a new shopping center or a uh, uh, redevelopment or reconstruction of a shopping center component all the way up to uh, even some of the specific plan areas that we have in the city. Um, some of those are not built out at this point, such as, such as the uh, Seventh Day of Venice project site. There's still future developments there. These projects, uh, although they have been approved, the specific plan has in those uh, requirements uh, conditions to meet the stormwater requirements of the prior permit. So those would continue on uh, so that uh, an additional uh, project in that uh, area suddenly doesn't become subject to this new, uh, the new requirements. Uh, also, any uh, specific plan or uh, development agreements that come out are accepted as complete prior to this October 11th uh, uh, date would also uh, go back to the uh, 2000 permit requirements. Right. Sure. And I, I, thank you. I, I noticed you also used some of our vernacular there, the SQUIMP requirements that John was mentioning. Stormwater Quality Urban Impact Mitigation Plan, that was under the old 2000 permit. Essentially what I said, uh, scrubbing the water and, and then reducing the amount of runoff to uh, the pre-existing condition or to the Q10 developed. And there I go, start talking jargon too. Um, also, uh, the third bullet, if a developer has already undertaken the design or development or actual construction of public improvements for the sake of the project, it is also exempted and grandfathered in under the old terms of stormwater permitting. Four and five are the uh, local agency projects. If, uh, if the governing body, say it, the, uh, the board or the council has approved the design of the project prior to the October 11th date, then those projects are considered grandfathered and exempt. Also, uh, the um, uh, tentative maps have been kind of messed with at the state level with the Subdivision Map Act and tap tentative map extensions and so forth, and certain parameters are required, like the map has to be substantially the same as it was. If it gets refiled or extended, uh, it can also remain exempt from the requirements. What's so bad about all these requirements? Uh, we've had some local communities actually refer to this as the development apocalypse. And the problem is, of course, that we're accustomed to gathering water onto the site, sticking it into a pipe, and running it off the site. And now we're being required to rethink that whole approach that we've been using for the last 100 years in development. And it's a, it's a real shocker to try to make a, a watershed that's primarily focused uh, or comprised of rocks and clay type soils to force it to retain water on site. So that's the real challenge. Um, the new development requirements then, um, any of these projects that are listed, you'll find that the uh, one of the terms that's really key in this discussion is the one acre size, the uh, 5,000 and 10,000 square feet of disturbed and impervious areas. Those are key terms that reappear over and over again in these criteria. But basically parking lots, uh, uh, large homes, uh, commercial strip malls, and those types of things, those projects. Uh, the one in, uh, in bullet number four there, environmentally sensitive area, we don't have too many soft bottom channels, but essentially a soft bottom channel where the, where the project might discharge to um, is also one of those that um, uh, has some special requirements involved because you have to make sure that absolutely no pollutants get into the areas where they might uh, uh, pollute the uh, groundwater that's underneath the tributaries industrial parks and of, of course uh, retail gasoline stations, automotive repair stations and uh, restaurants are also going to have to comply. Redevelopment, as I mentioned earlier, have some specific provisions required. The creation and addition or replacement of more than 5,000 square feet of impervious surface area, that can mean going from parking lot to building uh, would still be required to um, mitigate for stormwater. 5,000 square feet is not very much. It's about the equivalent of 25 parking spaces. So uh, again, if you're talking about redevelopment, this isn't very friendly for someone who's trying to do a demo rebuild type of a thing. Uh, the existing sing single family are essentially uh, exempt accessory structures such as detached garages, uh, room additions. The smaller types of, of uh, work would be exempted. The larger estate type homes might encounter this if they reach the 10,000 square foot threshold. And also uh, if there's any kind of an emergency, say a water line break or, break or a, uh, a sunken roadway or something like that that might endanger or jeopardize public health, safety and welfare, then those types of projects would also be exempted under these redevelopment requirements. 
Here's some of the fun. We get to look at some of the pictures of things. Uh, Post-construction stormwater BMPs are best management practices. These are ideas, concepts, things that we're going to start seeing more and more of on, on uh, proposed development projects. In this case, uh, some of these pictures are from the uh, San Mateo County. They actually have, are somewhat ahead of us on, in, in regard to getting this type of uh, best management practice or BMP implemented. But you have here a vegetative swale that's on the side of the road. Um, just to let you know, um, there's a contemplated uh, rain garden or best management practice such as this uh, on the Municipal Service Center uh, expansion that we're trying to get funding for. Uh, out at the um, MSC, they're going to be having some bump outs that have rain gardens such as this and uh, little notches in the curbs to allow the flow to enter into the vegetative area to soak in. And we're just going to experiment with that and try to see how it works and try to use it as kind of an exhibition project for, uh, for the public to see. Here's another focus on a, a, a swale that's actually filled with a bunch of vegetation. You can see the notches in the curbs are actually those look like bumpers but the water flows into the vegetation and soaks in and actually gets cleaned as it goes through. So all of the uh, metals and the oils and the, the greases that get into the runoff are being treated bio biologically by the plants. Here's a local example of that type of a thing. This is the Wendy Vito project up on uh, Old Caneo Road at Wendy. Uh, you might remember the old Joanne Fabric place. Uh, that was redeveloped by Howard Smuckler, and he did this very same thing, where he has notches in the curbs. You can see on the photo on the le on the left there, and uh, this is an, a two two year old picture. So the vegetation is well established now, but it gives you an idea of how it works. The water flows into the planter, and then uh, it gets scrubbed by the plants as it moves its way over to the downstream receiving curb, and then flows out to that. Uh, uh, grate that you see there. Now that grate's accumulated some leaves and of course like I said maintenance is important and I don't think you can really make it out there but there is a screening device inside that catch basin that um, captures the small floatables and small particulates uh, that also has to be vacuumed out on a regular basis. Pervious paving, another favorite thing you might have heard about. But most of them look like uh, cottage cheese as opposed to nice smooth concrete. Uh, the next picture kind of shows that a little bit more detail. This is an installation at Costa Mesa that I happened to visit, and you can see my trusty blue pen there kind of give you some perspective on the size. But it's very open-graded, very uh, odd-looking. It looks kind of like I said, uh, cottage cheese. Very effective ab at absorbing water and allowing it to soak through. Pervious pavers. This is Keith Sinclair's building, the old Verizon building over on the boulevard. And he uh, redid the rib ribbon gutter with uh, basically gapped uh, pavers. So there's a sand bed underneath, and the, the pavers have not undulated. They've been very well steadied by that mowing strip-looking thing on the sides there. But uh, that's another opportunity for water to flow through the sand. Uh, microbial action being what it is, it actually does get scrubbed and then falls into a perforated pipe that's about three feet underground and uh, channeled out into the storm drain. Again, the new features in the new permit are going to require full capture, and so we'd have to find a way to reuse that water as opposed to discharge it into the storm drains. Fire retention area, another compliments of our San Mateo County friends, and I think I've got a, a picture also of that one, don't I, John? Next, next slide. Yeah, this is a proposed development. Uh, actually, it's a project uh, that the city is proposing to the uh, Caneo Rec and Park District. Uh, over on Michael Drive at Borchard, you guys might recognize the service station there across the street. Uh, we have a pretty sizable tributary to this location, about 107 acres of surface drainage, a lot of runoff. And so this is an opportunity for us to not only capture runoff and scrub it a little bit, because it gets kind of murky and cappuccino looking, but it also an opportunity to shave off some of the peak by capturing it in, in the uh, vegetation and actually make use of it um, for uh, irrigation purposes. So we're still pending on that. The, uh, the CRPD board has yet to examine it for approval. I think it's going before them on October 5th. Another local example, the Brim Hall Library. You guys might have seen this. This was put in as part of the mitigation for the uh, Children's Library Annex. Uh, however, as I said before, the new permit is going to require full capture. This particular configuration has a, a raised uh, concrete uh, inlet that you can see there kind of in the foreground behind the cattails and when the water ponds up high enough the water will actually get into the drain and actually be able to relieve out through the uh, 
uh, Land Creek wash behind. But in uh, in the future, we're not going to have that discharge point. We have to figure out some way to do something with the water that we're capturing. This is over at the uh, Westlake Plaza Center. West Tackett did this project. And uh, this is another uh, biofiltration type of a, a device. It's a, a best management practice that has loose fitting cobbles on either side of the embankments, plus uh, some kind of dry, drought tolerant and uh, mulchy type of plants. And again, the, you might be able to see a dip in the parking lot off there in the distance. It kind of channels in at the, at the upstream end of the channel uh, through the parking lot and then down into this uh, uh, bioswale kind of a device. And then at the end, of course, it's allowed to discharge clean water into the uh, Westlake uh, tributary. Harvested rainwater, this is really popular down in Los Angeles City and Ventura City is starting to get on board with this and we will be too. Uh, the idea of trying to do something to prevent uh, water from discharging off the site may hold merit. Uh, we haven't figured yet how to uh, successfully scrub this water so it's potable but uh, or usable for uh, planting purposes but uh, we're, we're understanding that technology is being implied uh, up in the San Mateo area as well as Los Angeles City, so it's just a matter of time before we figure it out and use it down here. Hopefully we can borrow from them on how they did it. Uh, but that should be a solution for some of the smaller developments, say the 10,000 square foot commercial type developments. And of course I mentioned maintenance. That's kind of a key element here. This is the McDonald's down on the boulevard that was recently redeveloped. Uh, the the old style ribbon gutters used to surround the restaurant. Now it's uh, raised up high and everything drains out to the perimeter landscaping through those little weep holes that you see there. Uh, if those holes become encumbered by, you know, a, a McDonald's cup or a wrapper or something like that, uh, or uh, the vegetation dies out, then it's not going to be very useful at cleaning up the stormwater, nor is it going to actually convey the flow into the planters. So maintenance is a key element of this uh, whole program. And so that's why the, the permit specifically reads that you should be considering that first when you're developing a design. So in summary, there you have it. Uh, our 2010 permit is pretty, uh, pretty uh, in, intense when it comes to uh, treating water uh, to get it clean and also to capture it and not let it run off the site. Uh, the new technical manual goes into effect in October. And uh, I would expect you're going to see a lot more landscaping uh, emphasis on, on new permits or new uh, entitlements as they come before you. And uh, I guess with that, we can entertain any questions. Questions to staff? No questions. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, we'll go to uh, the second item. Uh, Mr. Spector.
put it full screen again. Voila. If at first you don't succeed, try, 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 try again. So this, this shouldn't take too much time. Uh, what we have before us tonight is consideration of a request by the Caneo Valley Unified School District to uh, confirm that the sale of uh, certain real property that they uh, currently own is in conformity, conformity with the general plan of the city of Thousand Oaks and there's two separate properties involved with this request. The first property is located on uh, Los Arbolas uh, Drive and, or Avenue and uh, it's next to the university school as shown on the slide here. Uh, interesting thing about this site, it's already been entitled with a uh, tentative tract. The current general plan uh, designation is low density residential and the zoning is RPD 4.5 units per acre and reserved for single family residential. Here it shows the uh, general plan land use uh, map. You can see the low density uh, residential designation just north of the school. The site's 2.75 acres, it's vacant at this time. And as I said before, it was approved just recently by the Planning Commission for uh, 10 single family lots. Second site's on Caneo Center Drive, shown on this photo, it's a larger site. Uh, the current general plan land use element designation is institutional and it's in a specific plan and it has its own land use designation called school maintenance area. It's a general plan uh, map showing the site. The blue is institutional. The uh, white area around it there is uh, industrial. It is 10 points 72 acres it's also vacant and there is no uh, use proposed for the property at this time it initially was um, envisioned as a, a maintenance area for the school district uh, warehouse and um, a bus storage location or depot location now another aspect of this parcel is there's a deed restriction uh, attached to it that uh, limits its use to public sur school purposes and that uh, restriction terminates in 2015. Not to say that uh, uh, the city who basically controls the restriction couldn't uh, change that uh, termination date. So uh, we're here to consider general plan consistency with the sale of these properties and uh, with the first site on Los Arbolas, it's clear the property is, has a general plan that's residential, it's got a zoning that's residential, and uh, it's got an approved project on it. So it's c very clear that the C sale of this property is consistent with our general plan. The Caneo Center site isn't quite so clear, um, but the the property ultimately, if it's to be put to use by a private party, they would have to come before the city and obtain a change to the general plan and the zoning. But that's not to say that a public 
use wouldn't be interested in that property. In that case, the institutional general plan designation would still be appropriate. So it would be a matter of speculation to determine whether, uh, well, to, to address the consistency issue. So staff's recommending that the commission confirm that this uh, sale by the school district is in conformity with the Thousand Oaks general plan. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions you might have. Oh, and by the way, we have a representative, a consultant, Joel Kirstenstein, with uh, who's a consultant uh, for the school district tonight. Thank you. Commissioner Reynolds. Thank you. Um, is the property on Canal Center Drive, down from it, it says high density, is that that apartments that were approved one time, or I know we discussed? Uh, Further to the north, right. there uh, is a, a property that the city owns, and then north of that property that's uh, privately owned, and it, it was uh, redesignated for high density residential purposes in order to uh, address the, scene, the, the city's right. responsibility or obligation to uh, provide high density housing, okay. the state obligation. I just remember doing that, but I wasn't too sure. I didn't remember where the property was. So thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Other questions? No, oh, thank you very much, Mr. Spector. You're welcome. Uh, so do we need a motion and a vote? Commissioner Reynolds. Oh, you want me to, uh, the recommendation is determine that the proposed disposal of real property by the Canal Unified School District is in conformity with the Thousand Oaks General Plan, and I will move in the affirmative that it is. Comments to the motion? Vote, please. Motion passed, 4-0. Uh, Mr. Town, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, looking ahead to your next two meetings, at your next meeting on September 26th, we will, of course, uh, have the uh, public hearing item that you heard tonight, uh, heard again in terms of the uh, transplantation evaluation of that tree. So that will be first on your agenda on the 26th, and then uh, we have the Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan that evening, so that will uh, take the balance of your time. And then on October 10th, we have one case showing on your schedule uh, for a special use permit, but we also have added another case that's not shown here yet that was just added recently uh, since the packet was, was produced. So you will have two hearings on October 10th as well. And uh, that's all I had at this time. Thank you. Uh, minutes of July 25th, 2011, Commissioner Reynolds. Move approval of the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting of July 25th, 2011. Vote, please. Motion passed, 4-0. Any AB 1234 reports? None. Commission comments? Commissioner Trapel? Uh Yes, Mr. Town, on, on the last thing that you were mentioning about that's going to be coming back with regards to the tree, didn't we also have the motion that the staff was going to see the availability of the 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 15, <laughs> the 6-gallon? Correct, as well as the six, availability of the 6-gallon. Okay, correct. I just want to make sure. Yes. That's it. Any other commission comments? Nope. Okay, we'll adjourn to 6.30 p.m. on September 27th, 2011.